Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today for the committee's oversight hearing on protecting seniors from the extreme heat and cold. This past summer was brutal. It was the hottest summer on record for our planet, and July was the 10th hottest month ever recorded for our city. Heat emergency posed a great risk for everyone, but especially our seniors. Seniors are more vulnerable to extreme high temperatures since their bodies are less able to regulate heat. Every year, our city averaged 450 heat-related emergency room visits, 150 heat-related hospital admissions, and 13 heat strokes. Many of these hospital visitors are seniors. With this reality, New York City operates 500 cooling centers, which are institutions and spaces that allow the public to come in for air conditioning during hot weather. The city has cooling centers as senior centers in public housing facility and public library for the public during heat emergencies. These cooling centers are especially important to help protect our seniors during extreme hot temperatures. However, it was recently reported that many cooling centers are unreasonably far from seniors. In fact, 30% of seniors live more than a half a mile from cooling centers, and many seniors have difficulty finding cooling centers altogether. This is unacceptable. Many seniors, especially those who have mobile issues, may feel discouraged from going to a cooling center because it's too far and others may opt out of going altogether because cooling centers are a headache to find. According to the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, the majority of their 249 senior centers act as cooling centers. I understand that DIFTA senior centers represent less than half of all city cooling centers, but I want to stress that DIFTA, as our city's aging department, should be our seniors' loudest advocates and thus DIFTA is not off the hook. I would like to know how DIFTA is coordinating with other city agencies to get the word out about cooling centers to older adults, how DIFTA is helping to keep these cooling centers running during the heat waves, and what role is DIFTA playing in getting seniors to the closest cooling center. I also want to express my concern about seniors who live alone and may be suffering during heat wave with no one to turn to. I want to know what the agency is doing to reach this vulnerable subsets of seniors too. While the summer is coming to an end, winter is right around the corner. I'm also interested in learning how DIFTA is preparing to help protect our city senior during another possibly brutal cold season. We have heard reports from providers that many senior centers' cooling and heating system are in dire need of repairs. In the, council's, in the council's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, we call for fully funding capital needs across 255 senior centers and community centers in NYCHA's portfolio. We also call for a new expense funding stream of a million dollar to ensure rapid completion of emergency repairs to cooling and heating systems within NYCHA's development and elsewhere. I look forward to hearing updates from DIFTA about how much funding the agencies has used so far to help malfunctioning systems and where senior, and where senior center, especially those in NYCHA's, are with receiving vital repairs on their heating and cooling system. Together with DIFTA, the committee wants to make sure that our seniors are protected during this upcoming winter season and that we are ready to address heat waves again next summer. I'd like to thank the committee staff for helping in organizing this hearing. Our council, Nusat Chaudhary, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, and fin finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Dohini Supura. I also like to thank my legislative director, Marion Gira, and I'd like to uh, thank the council member of the committee that have joined us today, council member Diaz and council member Vallon. Um, I would like to now ask our council to, um, to minister the oath uh, to the panel.
please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Welcome, Commissioner, again. <laughs> your second hearing? Okay, great. Good morning. Good morning, Chairwoman Chin and members of the Aging Committee. As you said, September is National Preparedness Month. So I thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and the committee members and the City Council for convening this timely hearing that sheds light on how we are prepared to ensure older New Yorkers continue to access much needed services during weather-related emergencies. Given the impact of climate change, we are all undoubtedly believe that weather conditions may become more frequent and more severe in the future. Before I proceed with the cooling center testimony and detailing the steps taken and some of the lessons learned this past July and August, I ask that you allow me just a few seconds the opportunity to provide an update on the air conditioning, installations, repairs, and improvement at the, the sites. Thank you uh, for your advocacy to the mayor. DIFTA received $4 million in baseline funding to help with these much needed repairs. Before I became commissioner, there were approximately 34 sites that required air conditioning improvement. By late spring, that number dramatically reduced to approximately 12 or a dozen and by July, all had some work in progress. As of today, I am pleased to re report that only six remain in the final stages of repair or procurement or in some kind of procurement uh, process. That being said, interim provisions, including portable and window air conditioning units were made available if appropriate and when needed. As a result of these improvements and repairs, we were better prepared to face the heat waves that we experienced this July and August, which serves as a great segue to DIFTA's emergency preparedness plan, which includes cooling centers. For the past 12 years, DIFTA, the Department for the Aging, has had a Bureau of Emergency Preparedness responsible for developing DIFTA's emergency preparedness plan, an overarching goal of which is to provide older New Yorkers, DIFTA staff, and the contracted service providers information necessary to help ensure safety before, during, and after an emergency. DIFTA's emergency response plan, consistent with similar protocols set forth by sister agencies, including New York Police Department, the Fire Department, and others, detailed procedures and protocols to be employed by each DIFTA bureau our Bureau of Community Services, our Long-Term Care, and our Active Aging Bureau during specific emergencies, including heat, power outages, coastal storms, transportation disruptions, and winter weather. It also includes a provide a local emergency response plan for each contract agency. Before I go on, it is important to note the many tools that city employs to provide information to the public. Chief among them are Notify NYC and the NYC Emergency Management, the NYSEM-led Advanced Warning System, the AWOS. During an emergency, agencies work with the mayor's office <clears throat> to issue press releases, update social media, and provide information to 311 and send messaging. Notify NYC, the city's free emergency notification system, has grown significantly since launching in 2007, and now has 7, 770,000 subscribers. It has expanded to offer common notification in 13 languages, American Sign Language, and audio formats. There is a mobile application that has been set, sent to more than, uh, that has been seen by more than 80,000 downloads. Notify NYC is advertised through a variety of outlets including bus shelters, social media. 
ready New York events, newsletters, elected official, and other means. Registration is free and open to anyone with information provided through a landline phones, mobile phones, instant message, or emails, and again, through social media. Having access to a computer in order to register is no longer required. Registration is also available by calling 311, and residents who prefer to receive the information through their lawn lines, which we know is a choice for many seniors, have that as an option. The AWS is designed to alert organizations who work with people with disabilities and or access and functional needs to, a variety, uh, to various types of hazard and, and emergencies in New York City. Uh, emergencies in New York City that may affect people's independence and their daily lives. Participating organizations receive public preparedness and emergency information intended for use by individuals with disabilities or access or functional needs. These organizations then rely this in, through this information via email, text, or direct call. <clears throat> and these organizations can do that to, to their clients as well as to other organizations. As such, emergency information is ultimately provided to individuals through trusted pre-existing conditions and specific to their needs. Often, that organization will play a role in that person's emergency plan as they provide an essential service that enables their continued independence in the community. During larger emergencies, such as snowstorms or extreme heat, NISIM, the New York City's emergency management team also hosts conference calls with city agencies and large service providers to give them direct information and guidance to pass along to their clients. Now, referring back to cover the course of the past 12 years, key functions of the Bureau of Emergency Preparedness has been to raise awareness of possible and impending emergencies during weather-related uh, weather advisories, tips and guidance before, during, and after serious weather conditions. With respect to facing an emergency, a key focus has been on the provisions of alternate congregate food service, especially in the event of a center closure, as well as protocol for provisions for home delivered meals, case management, and home care services. Briefly, I'll just give you an overview. In the event of a snow-related uh, emergency activations, we advise senior centers to ask their seniors to stay at home and to avoid walking in the streets. Fall prevention, this is Fall Prevention Month. Fall prevention is a key signature project of the Department for the Aging. In anticipation of inclement weather and center closures, most center participants will receive an emergency food package that contains food for three days. For home delivered meals, when we have ample lead time, extra food packages can be sent with the last home delivered meal service. If we have less lead time, as, as, as is often in the case of emergencies, we can help ensure seniors receive extra emergency food packages. Moreover, meal delivery drivers are asked to report on the conditions of the homebound elderly. During the summer, seniors are to be asked if they need to be taken to a cooling center. During the winter, drivers observe home conditions and alert their agency of the safety and health concerns that they may have. Additionally, one case management agents, additionally, case management agencies may direct, uh, make direct phone calls to access clients' conditions and needs. We had what we believed to be a solid emergency plan in place. The plan, however, was put to test during the sustained multi-day extreme heat emergency of this past July. And there were several emergencies this past July and August. On July 13th, the city experienced a localized blackout in Manhattan that had a significant impact on a senior center in the theater district, Encore Neighborhood Senior Center. Initially, there was no disruption of service or food damage as power was restored quickly. On July 16th, however, when the center opened and was in full operation, several participants and staff fell sick. It was later discovered that they were exposed to carbon monoxide poisoning 
stemming from a damaged exhaust system caused by the outage. Participants and staff were immediately given medical attention. It's not in my testimony, but the staff of that center, Jeremy and the program director, Jose, were exceptional in their response and immediately contacted DIFTA. Uh, the center was immediately uh, closed. People were evacuated and given medical attention. DIFTER and the center director joined, um, jointly engaged the fire department and the Department of Buildings to inspect and work, to inspect the work and to reopen the premises. The outage impacted the integrity of a gas line. While the center has since reopened, this program had to use a caterer to continue meal service for an extended period of time until Con Edison could approve and indicate that it was, uh, the line was fully operational. Although this, un this, uh, this situation was unfortunate, it tested our emergency outage response capability, which prepared us for the outages in parts of Brooklyn later uh, that week. Although none of the Brooklyn providers located within the outage zones were affected, we contacted each of them to ensure their emergency plans were in place. Also, on July 16th, the mayor declared a heat emergency for Friday, July 16th, 19th through Sunday, July 21st. Once the heat emergency was declared, New York City Emergency Management began the activation process for cooling centers throughout the city. There are over 580 cooling centers identified throughout the five boroughs, of which 249 were DIFTA congregate sites. The city had a, has a public communication and messaging process to ensure that people are accurately can accurately identify their nearest cooling center. The cooling center finder is activated the day before the centers are open. Also prior to the sev uh, uh, summer months, DIFTA, eva DIFTA along with NISIM evaluates its cooling center locations to make sure they are operational and have been a uh, visible signage in advance of heat emergencies. Upon activation of the heat plan, DIFTA, along with other cooling center partners such as NY uh, NYCHA, DYCD, Salvation Army, and the public library systems, worked to confirm the center's um, hours of operation. It was during this process when DIFTA began calling its congregate sites to re uh, request that they extend hours beyond their regular service hours where possible and to prepare for activation through uh, Sunday, July 21st. While many centers were able to adjust their schedules, some centers had certain restrictions and limitations to opening beyond regular business hours. In theory, a cooling center should be available to operate beyond regular business hours if the emergency requires it, to make sure that they are open and to help the public alleviate the hardship of excessive heat. All right. DIFTA, however, has no authority to mandate 249 senior centers, and I don't like the word senior centers, congregate uh, centers, to operate beyond regular service hours. Serving as a cooling center outside of regular business hours is not a requirement under existing contract. It is strictly voluntary. This process not only revealed uh, that we needed to reclassify DIFTA's cooling centers that were not, able to, uh, were not able to provide services on extended hours, but it also revealed that the partnership between DIFTA, the contractors, and their commitment to serve older New Yorkers in an, in an emergency is not as congruent as one would like to think or, or expect. It took an enormous amount of staff time to engage and enroll a number of service providers to open re beyond regular service hours. It was during this protracted engagement process that we were able to identify several impediments and barriers to opening many cooling centers, again, beyond extended hours for weekends and holidays. Just I want to be to emphasize that the cooling centers on Friday during the day 
the 20, 249 centers served about 23,000 uh, individuals during those regular hours. I'll give you the numbers for the extended hours at a later point in the testimony. However, we, uh, we realized that there were religious observation limitations and also leasing arrangements and occupancy arrangements, which ultimately precluded or barred a number of centers from opening. As a result, 29, I mean 49, of the 249 uh, cooling centers were unable to uh, open beyond extended hours and their days of operations for a weekend. We adjusted their schedules on the cooling center finder accordingly. It was encouraging that 100 contractors immediately responded and said that they would be open for extended hours on Friday and would open again Saturdays and Sunday. That said, as we got closer to Friday, as a new commissioner, I was dismayed. Um, and concerned that many providers had not responded to our calls or emails. I then wrote a letter to all the contractors asking that they reconsider and inform us of the limitations that prevented them from opening and that we would work with them to mitigate some of those impediments, such as staff overtime, limited staff, refreshment costs. In that same letter, I reminded them of their professional obligations and commitment to the quality of life of New Yorkers New York's older population. After, the sen after sending the letter, I also reached out to some of our, of our umbrella organizations, including Live On New York and United Neighborhood Houses, to assist us in our outreach efforts and to encourage their respective members to open uh, during this uh, extreme heat emergency. This was unprecedented. Both responded immediately, and I want to personally thank Allison and Susan for their partnership. It's worth noting that NISIM also provided, a, was an incredible partner because they gave us staff supports through the community emergency response teams in cases um, for those centers where we had staff shortages and uh, which prevented the center from opening. So we were able to open some of them with that additional staff. Moreover, NISIM has graciously, graciously agreed to review and offer suggestions to our emergency plan provisions that we have made since um, the July incident. All that to say that we are extremely grateful for all our partners, including those service providers, contractors that recognized the heat emergency of July 19 through July 21. Something wrong with this. Uh, in, yeah, no, I read this is. Yet I was surprised and disappointed. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Yet I was surprised and disappointed by the service providers who were reluctant to open and required a call from me or our chief operating officer or senior staff to get them to reconsider. This is not what I expected as a new commissioner from a network that so often is vocal and effective when they perceive the needs of older New Yorkers are not being met. By Friday afternoon, the first day of the excessive heat, we have activated 138 DIFTA cooling centers who agreed to extend hours. 114 were activated for a Saturday and 101 for a Sunday. Again, I want to reiterate that 249 were available during regular working hours. It was also gratifying to see how the centers, the cooling centers, if the cooling centers took charge, they were well attended and very active. And I'm going to do a, Lor a Lorraineism here. In East Harlem, I was, I, was at, I was invited to join a karaoke group, which I declined to make sure that they didn't leave in, in a mass exodus. In the Bronx, the seniors were watching a Madea family movie, which was quite fun, uh, which we were also low to interrupt just with our greetings. Despite the initial challenges to get DIFTA cooling centers open, we were informed by NISM that the DIFTA cooling centers uh, that offered extended hours and days of operation on the weekend housed more than 50% of the New Yorkers seeking comfort during extended operational hours. 
On Friday, again, beyond our regular working hours when we had, I think it was 23,000 uh, in attendance. On Friday, for the extended hours, we had 3,093 individuals attending. On Saturday, there were 4,688 who attended, and on Sunday, 4,064 attended. The DIFTA cooling centers, as expected, welcomed older New Yorkers, but they also gave respite to New York City's families and children. In closing, we are all well prepared that extreme weather can disproportionately impact vulnerable New Yorkers, as the chairwoman stated earlier, including older adults far greater than other communities. This is why emergency preparedness and adaptability remain among DIFTA's priorities. Emergencies, by definition, are unexpected, and each vary in effectiveness and intensity and, se and severity. Lessons continue to be learned during each occurrence, and plans are adjusted accordingly. And because the, event, the current and future risk in light of our changing climate are significant, strategic adaptation to heat emergencies is a key priority for the mayor. We look forward to our continued work with all of our partners, including the City Council, to review and adapt our protocols to adjust to this new normal. Again, I thank you for your interest and partnership in addressing this ongoing concern. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. And we also have been joined by other community uh, committee member, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Rose, and Council Member Deitch. I'm gonna start off with a couple of questions and then I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues. So if you have questions, uh, please let us know. Oh, okay. And thank you, Commissioner, for your comprehensive uh, testimony. You have answered some of our questions. And uh, now you gave us the statistics uh, about the, the centers uh, with the cooling system being repaired and now is only um, down six. to six. Six. What was the, uh, how much of the total budget um, has been used? I don't have that number because it's a work in progress, but I can get you that information. Okay, and then like, yeah, we wanna know, you know how much you're gonna be, uh, expect to use you know, by January, uh, January, and also we have heard from some providers that, yeah, they have, you know, air conditioning, but it's not, um, it's not that strong, because <laughs> you have seniors complaining that you call this a cooling center, <laughs> it's not that cool. Uh, so we also want to know, like, what is the, um, the all the center know about the procedure, how they can apply for that money. Uh, if they have, um, you know, issues with their cooling system, with their HVAC system? You know, everyone does know how every, every uh, senior center, every, I don't like that word, senior center, every congregate site and every uh, diff the contractor knows exactly what the procedures are to uh, inform us. We have a close partnership to inform us of when repairs are needed or when a replacement is needed. That being said, we know that the air conditioners and this repair is required vary. And it, it's so dependent, uh, so there's no one answer to say this could be done in five weeks, two weeks, four, four days. And it's because of the type of repair that's needed, the kind of location that it's in, uh, whether it's an expense or whether it is a capital need, whether it's CDBG money. So each one of those requires an assessment and, 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 a, and a process. But the process is the same. They inform us. We then uh, work with either them and their landlord to make the proper arrangements if, if they have a leasing uh, limitation. And then we work through the budget process uh, to see, we have a team, uh, a facilities team at DIFTA that reviews each one of these situations to uh, determine what, what will be required and then also uh, reviews bids 
um, before we can actually commence uh, payment and installation. So in your testimony, you would also talk about that some of the centers, you know, got some temporary, whether it's window air conditioning or some yeah. other cooling units. I don't, I don't know that this would have been a normal protocol. I think mm -hmm. July taught us, uh, both us and some of my other uh, partners at cooling centers, that this was an extreme situation and that there were two factors that we needed to handle, uh, but we had alternate means of cooling. So it could have been putting in additional window units. It could have been having portable units so that we tried to mitigate the circumstances as much as possible. Um, yeah, but the extreme, the, the interesting piece, uh, of course I'm going off topic here. The interesting piece was that heat emergency, um, because we were concerned about outages, we needed to also moderate the kind of temperature that we were using air conditioners at so that we wouldn't have a greater emergency on our hand. Yes, I remember we all had to like raise the temperature in the office. Right, we all had to endure um, 78 degrees. 78. Um, the other thing that you um, talked about uh, in your testimony was the reaching out to the homebound seniors. Yes. Right? Um, have you gotten feedback from the agency that provide Meals on Wheels, uh, their assessment on how many seniors that don't have air conditioning units or need to be transported uh, to a cooling center? Did DIFTA collect any of that information? We do not have that information yet, uh, but we do know what I do know and what I can uh, say with certainty is that each case management agency and home delivered meal provider was asked to call the clients and uh, our participants. And as a result, uh, they were able to then provide whatever was needed. The, we have a provision within our case management agencies who deal with homebound elderly that they have additional funds to provide transportation should that be required or any of the needs that that individual may have. If we could not, for some reason, transport that individual, we then contact the family and involve them in the uh, emergency situation. So it's, it's DIFTA working with the state. There's a state home energy assistance program. There's some seniors who are calling you know, our office and asking, well, I heard that, I read in the paper that you can help us get an air conditioned unit uh, or some subsidies to help pay electric bill. Um, does DIFTA help you know, promote that program or is that a... Eileen, do we have anything on The heat that? program. The, 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 the heat program. I'm sorry, go ahead, come, come. Eileen Malarkey is our assistant commissioner for in-home services and case management. Okay, the council have to square you in. Okay. okay. So she can provide the details that I cannot. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Um, the case management agencies do know, do know about HEAP and that's something they would discuss with their clients. And they also have, as the commissioner mentioned, some special supplemental funds and if a client needed an air conditioner that they you know, couldn't get uh, through another source, they would help them purchase it. So do you have any, uh, so can you share with us like in terms of how much additional funding that they do get because relating to that is I, I was um, you know, surprised to hear from your testimony that some of the centers didn't cooperate or didn't well, I, do I anything. Well, I think in the long run, everybody hour. cooperated. It's just that it, I was stunned the amount of person hours that it took to get people to that point. And I, it, Livon and UNH were very supportive in making sure that those numbers kept increasing. But I think with that is like, my concern is the resources that could be available. So like in the next RFP for center, we should really think about you know, having that as one of the 
either criteria requirement or like having funding provided so that centers can offer uh, extended hours for emergencies and another situation that, that might come up. Um, Councilwoman, you're absolutely right. That was one of the lessons learned because we saw that that was one of the barriers. So in, in subsequent RFPs, which we will be issuing, issuing two, one for home delivered meals and one for our congregate uh, centers, we will put that provision that if you are a designated cooling center that there's an agreement uh, to provide extended hours and that we will work with you in concert to make sure that we can adopt and mitigate some of the concerns and barriers. That would be great because a lot of the centers probably could even open on the weekends because <laughs> seniors also or older adults uh, could definitely use, you know, use the activities or the meals or whatever and we really need to right. kind of expand the services and it's a great opportunity with the new RFP that we can explore that. I look forward to, you know, working with you and the advocates um, yeah. on that. Yeah, so, so do we. Um, Councilmember Diaz, I'm going to pass it on to you to ask your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, good morning. Good morning. You know, I'm, I'm always, sometimes I am afraid to ask questions because most of the time the response that I get is I get back to you. It never happened. But I'm, I'm going to take the chance today, I'm going to ask you some questions. Well, you know me, so if I say I'm going to get back to you, you know I will. Castle Hill Senior Center. Huh? Castle Hill Senior yes. Citizen Center. Mm -hmm. The problem with the air conditioning and the, heat, and the heating system have been for years and years and years. Every single year, we call you. Every single year, single year we call Niger. <clears throat> what is the problem? Because always the response is, oh, we, we are calling a contractor, a contractor will be there. But every year, the seniors, in Castle Hill Senior Centers, suffering. When would that suffering end? I can tell you that as I said earlier in my testimony, the repair of some of these systems is quite complicated because of the age of the system and also maybe the location of the HVAC system. So there are many factors that make it difficult and challenging to make those repairs. I can tell you that Castle Hill is one of those centers that is being worked on right now and I can get you the details as to the status of it after this hearing, and I will make sure that I give that to both the chairwoman and you so that you will have your answer. Well, you know, as they used to say in the Game of Thrones, winter, what? Who would, one of as my they favorites. used to say in, in, the, in the Game of Thrones, uh -huh. winter is coming. Yes. <laughs> so what winter are we going to do? Winter is coming. It's a guaranteed thing. Uh, my last question, in May, the department uh, reported that there were 15 senior centers with mild functioning air conditioning and indicated the department that this will be resolved by the end of the summer. Have these cases been resolved? All of them have, all of them are in process with, as I said earlier, that they were, there were six that we still are either in procurement, right, or six that are either in procurement or are in some state of repair, all right? So the goal was, to, of course, to have them all done. By, by the, the end of the summer, that's what you testified, the department I know, testified. I know exactly what I testified. I well, the exactly department testified said. that they will be resolved by the end of the summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now you say it's in process. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that all, all but six were done, and the six that are still remaining 
are either in a process of being are in some form of the completion process in some part of the completion is, process. Is Caso he one of them? No, I can't answer that. I don't have that answer for you right now. So let me see if we could. By the end of the summer. By the I, end of the summer, we are you are you foreseeing are you foreseeing that these fifteen senior centers? Oh, by the end of the, of summer, the summer, you're summer. assuming that the summer has not ended. I assume I, I know, can say you, that, not knowing exactly what the state of each one of the six are, I cannot affirm that that will happen, but I can say with certainty that most of them will. I can get back to you with the state of each one of those, and I can state at that time which ones will be completed by the end of the summer and which ones will not. So you will get back to me on that. I also I will get back also, to you. And also on the status of Castle Hill. I will get back to you on those two points. I will love you more if you do that. I'm sure you will. Thank I you. will make sure that I give that to you, and I will also give it to the chair so that it'll be for the record. Thank right? you, Commissioner. You're more than welcome. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Ayala. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, so I guess I, it's just really a, a, a quick question. At those sites that were not, that did not have a functioning HVAC or H AC unit, was an alternative location identified? So there were there were two processes, right? So there was alternative uh, sites, and we offered transportation. I have to say we offered an extensive transportation plan that wasn't used um, during the crises of July. And we also, if not, if not an alternative site, if we could, we supplemented by adding, you know, additional cooling uh, functions. And I, the second is not so much a question, but uh, more of a, I guess a suggestion because having done, you know, I, I, I remember having to staff uh, cooling sensors uh, during the summer in my tenure, you know, at, at senior centers that I worked in. Um, and, you know, finding it to be the most boring experience of my life because nobody would ever show up. Um, and I think that the reason that nobody showed up was because we could have done a million things differently. One, we could have outreached to the immediate community beyond the senior center community, um, which we typically focus on, right? Um, but we forget that we also have, especially since most of the senior centers are cited in NYCHA facilities, that there should be, you know, uh, an attempt to maybe flyer the buildings, um, at least even if it's just, you know, the, the buildings of that development, so that the seniors know that this is, you know, this is a, a, a cooling center site that they can, you know, um, go to. But then also maybe in those cases, as I remember back then, you know, DIFTA offered some level of like reimbursement if there was some sort of cost attributed to the keeping the, you know, keeping the cooling center open of maybe offering a meal, right? Maybe a dinner, um, a movie night. Uh, so some sort of activity that would, you know, incentivize individuals um, and, and make them want to come because I wouldn't want to come to a senior center either. I was just sitting there, you know, in, in air conditioning, you know, bored to death when maybe I'm missing my telenovela or maybe, you know, like things are happening. Um, and just finding creative ways to, you know, encourage uh, participation so that we don't have staff just sitting idle in cooling centers and no one is really, you know, making use of that resource. I agree with you. Um, one of the protocols that we do have in place is we send out a, a form, a letter, to each one of the cooling centers and ask them to submit to us after the event uh, the amount of staff over time, the, the cost related to that, and other related costs so that we then reimburse them for some of those expenses, number one. Number two, I can tell you, um, Mitchell in particular, was hot and active that day. Yeah. There was one of those that I, I went in there and said, yeah. is this 78 degrees? Um, but it was active and, yeah. and participants were, were there and it was beyond um, senior centers. But you're absolutely right. I, can, I was um, pleased to see how active but the that's, I think that's because 
I think that the, the Mitchell site is a, is, a, is a good example of that because there's a connection with the resident association leadership. And so what doesn't leave the boundaries of the four walls of the, the senior center right. via the director or the coordinator uh, leaves um, via the, the resident association board that then you know ensures that the rest of the development is also aware. So it's, it's, a, it's really nice, right? Because then you know people use it, they know that it's there, but for the most part, I think it's just confusion about where is it, can I go, is it just for the members? Um, and just, right. you know, it's just to and really I think, And I think that's a messaging piece. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Because it's a, that was one of our lessons, that we needed to reinforce that the cooling center was there for beyond the, the older participants. And so that was also a lesson that we learned during this process. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rose, your question? Hi, how are you, Hi. Commissioner? How are you? Um, Commissioner, um, are the cooling centers and heating centers open overnight? Do people sleep in these centers? No. No, no um, they're, not, they're not open 24 hours. In cases of extreme weather, um, what happens to um, these seniors that, you know, now need somewhere to stay because the the temperature in their home still hasn't either cooled down um, or in the winter time, they don't have heat. Mm -hmm. So do we have any, center, any centers that are um, available for overnight stays? None of the DIFTA uh, 249 facilities are open um, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, most are those who agreed to have extended hours most of those were till about eight o'clock in the evening. Eight o'clock. And then you provide transportation back to their homes. Well, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering what's being done to address the cooling and heating deserts in the city. Um, you know, for example, there are not some cooling or heating centers in some communities, Staten Island is one of those areas where uh, there's a great bit of different uh, distance um, between the um, identified cooling centers and and whole communities. So, um, what is done in in that case? Um, is there a bus provided so that and and even in some of these uh, deserts? there are no identified senior centers. Right. So there's really no place for them to go. Is there um, any plan in place to address these deserts where there are not um, cooling centers available? I'm gonna, um, I think you're absolutely right. It's something that we've been looking at with our partner, the mm -hmm. New York City Emergency Management Office. Um, we're looking at that uh, each of this, where the, we have the 249 senior centers, uh, but we're looking at that in Staten Island. We know that transportation is a challenge mm -hmm. and an issue. As a matter of fact, I was at, yesterday at JCC, and one yeah. of the first questions that came to me was like, what are you going to be doing to give us better transportation? Um, right. But I would uh, turn to my colleagues at the New York City Emergency Management be, uh, so that they can talk about how we're looking at addressing some of those uh, cooling center deserts. Good morning, Council Good morning. Um, yes, as uh, the commissioner said, we're going to be exploring on the off season how we can increase um, the number of cooling centers in areas of high vulnerability, high need, um, with partners that you know, might not be known to us right now. We're going to be exploring new partnerships and trying to address that need. Um, in cases uh, like in Staten Island, so where there are maybe not as many cooling centers. Um, and do you ever have a situation where there's, the volume exceeds the capacity of the cooling centers? And if so, what, what do you do? And, and that doesn't have to just be Staten Island because you know that probably yeah, that we doesn't happen in Staten Island, but do you ever have more volume than yeah, no. you have of capacity? All of, the, of all of the 
challenges we encountered <laughs> in July and August. That was not one of them. Um, the centers, um, as you well know, Councilwoman in Staten Island, are pretty large centers. Yeah. And so um, we, we have not heard that at all. Do you have any, um, I guess, clout with NYCHA to um, repair um, air conditioning units uh, in their centers that um, is it is it prioritized? Uh, do you provide um, so equipment, uh, you know, in, in that instance where, you know, um, our NYCHA senior centers are deficient? It's, it's one of the longstanding issues. I wouldn't say I have clout. I have a great partnership with NYCHA mm -hmm. and the senior centers. And thank you to the council and to the mayor. We have the $4 million to make those repairs, which is one of the things that Councilman uh, Diaz was alluding to. Uh, the, the, that work is in progress. So it is that strong partnership that we have established. During this heat emergency, we all responded with a sense of urgency, um, which is where we provided the alternative cooling units uh, where the HVAC or the repair was still too far out to address it. So um, it's that strong partnership with NYCHA and the Department for the Aging that has been strengthened and continues to, to, to grow uh, because they are such an important tenant, and we are such an important tenant Mm -hmm. in many of those NYCHA systems. And so in an instance where um, it's just not um, remediable, um, you know, within that time, it, does, it can't be expedited, um, do you provide transportation to other centers then? Should, should transportation be requested? Yes, we, can, we do that. And that was available during this July and August the two heat waves that we experienced in July and August. And I guess the uh, center personnel would have to do that. I mean, it seems to be a no-brainer to, you know, that if the seniors are sitting in a center without air, that, you know, the next well, logical there's step two would things be that occur. to... There's two things that occur that, are, that it's important to note. One, if a cooling center is unable to serve as a cooling center because of a malfunction, it gets off the cooling center roster. Staff mm -hmm. of, of the multiple agencies are in constant communication during the crises, during the emergency, and communicating, you know, like the situation has gotten dire, we can no longer serve, and so then we evacuate and move on. Uh, but then that center is then removed from the calling, uh, from cooling center calling list so that people are not, you know, directed there erroneously. And so how are the seniors notified that that, that is now the course of action? The, the seniors, the seniors, are, that, the seniors are on that the premise, obviously, that. will be mm -hmm. relocated. The, the public at large will be notified through the 311, no which longer is how available. you find out about a cooling center. Okay. Okay. All right. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, I just like to... Um, I think that the public should know um, identified sites that it should be easier to access. Not all of the seniors have access to, um, to the internet um, and that it should be, maybe there should be something ongoing, a, a list where people will know where these cooling centers are. Yeah, that's in a, in, a, in advance of you know a heat or a cold I can, emergency. I can, the there's two things that I can say to that. One is I strongly embrace your recommendation that we do a better job at reminding each senior center to remind their community mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they're a designated cooling center. So I, that is one thing that we will take up. The other thing that I think. Um, is important to, to state is that um, NISM works very closely with each one of the cooling centers and there's a visible signage that's up, not only during the summer months, mm -hmm. but it's visible. So it becomes, I all of a sudden noticed them, right? Mm -hmm. um, it becomes noticeable what's a cooling center, okay? 
But, uh, but if I'm not um, a person who goes to that senior center, I won't know that. Right. So I'm saying that, you know, for the general public. And my last question is, are, um, who um, inspects the, you know, the heating and the cooling oper operating plants prior to, you know, these weather emergencies? Do we know, you know, in advance who is, you know, prepared or, or online? Um, if there's an issue, can we get it taken care of before, you know, that particular season? So I'm going to answer and then I'm going to, I'll turn it over to my colleague at Nyson. What we do in, the, in advance, as obviously it depends on how much lead time we have, um, but during the year. No, I, I see, that's my point. I don't want there to have to be lead time. I, I, I want to know what happens ongoing to ensure that everything ongoing, is ready. Ongoing, each one of the, sea, uh, the cooling centers is inspected and does Annually. Uh, excuse me? Annually or? Yeah. On a regular basis, mm -hmm. and still designated as a cooling center. For example, if Mitchell, which it wasn't the case, if Mitchell's air conditioner went down, it would be taken off the cooling center mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. That was during the year or whatever until until that situation was remedied. And someone would continue to monitor that until it did. Right. 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 And so we would know that it was either right. up by the time we needed it, or it was still not. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Deitch. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. So, uh, firstly, um, my first questions are: Is um, what is? Um, do we know how many heat-related um, incidents there are, uh, fatalities? Uh, during a heat wave when it comes to senior citizens? And number two is that uh, does your office work with the medical examiner to uh, try to figure out to see how many uh, incidents there are in New York City in regards to heat-related incidents? And um, I'm just going to go to my questions because I only got a few minutes. And uh, also I wanted to ask is that, um, you know, as New, York, as New Yorkers, when we have a crisis, we all, we all get together and we all join together. So I always um, offer my office as a cooling center or, yeah. or during the winter months if people need to stay warm. You, you have probably over 50 city agencies. I'm not sure the exact number. How do the city agencies open their doors, uh, whether it's Department of Aging or OEM, their personal offices, and offer that as a cooling center? So I'll answer your first question. Um, when I'm God. I, I'm so sorry. I just had a senior moment. Can you repeat the first question? Oh sure. Um, so the first question is: Is I'm not uh, a senior do moment. We, I, do we do we know a uh, a number of how many fatalities there oh, are during the heat you. wave? That's why I that's why I went blank on it because I don't like that question. But um, we don't uh, we don't know that yet. Uh, that is something that we would not uh, look for. But we work with our partner agencies. Um, who work within the Department of Health and, and, um, and um, Mental Health. So how can we figure out to see how so, many, if there so are I, any fatalities, and, and this is what we know when we set at a hearing, what we need to talk about, about if, do we need additional resources, are there zero fatalities, are we doing a good enough job, and is, does the agency or OEM work with the medical examiner just to get that, those figures? Because the they would certainly know uh, if there are any uh, heat-related fatalities? The Department for the Aging, I'm responding from our perspective, the Department for the Aging does not use that information or seek that information. We would then rely on the sister agencies to do that, and you may want to answer how you collect that emergency-related data. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Um, the Department of Health and uh, Office of Chief Medical Examiner release that information, each summer's information, around November. Um, they are, they need to do a little bit more examining and they make sure that if there was um, deaths during the summer, they try to really make sure that there were not exacerbating factors that made it not a heat related death. So they come out with that data in November every year. So you, so every year you, you get those numbers. Um, what was it, what were the numbers for like, let's say 2008, the summer of 2018? 
I don't have those numbers, but I can get them for you. Okay, great. Okay, and also, I would also like to know for this this past heat wave with all the power no outages November. and everything yes. going on. You can get that. And um, that was my first part. And then the second part is is that how are city agencies setting an example uh, for others? Because since we can't get uh, sometimes um, these these congregant centers to open up, we can't force them to open up after hours. So how are city agencies opening their personal doors and 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 asking their staff to volunteer their time, um, if need be? That's a, that's a great question, and I also wanted to make a point um, to the councilwoman's question earlier. Um, because we work with such a wide variety of partners, we do actually have coverage seven days a week. Um, not as high as we do during Monday through Friday business hours, but because we work with organizations like um, Department for Youth and Community um, Development, um, they actually operate their cooling centers till 11 p.m. at night. So between um, DIFTA, which runs a little on the earlier side, and then DYCD, which runs on the later side, we do have coverage usually from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., Monday through Friday, and sometimes on the weekends. Um, during the extreme heat um, of this past summer of July, we did have some city agencies that opened their lobbies to allow people to come in for cooling. We did not find that those were very well utilized at all. Um, we find, and I think um, the commissioner has really alluded to this in her testimony, we find that um, agencies and organizations that are already based in the community that offer wraparound services, that offer movies or or meals or activities really have a much higher success rate at getting people to come in and be cool. Um, so although we have had great success getting our agency partners to open their doors during extreme heat um, emergencies, we don't find that they're as desirable to most people who are looking to get cool as an existing um, program in the neighborhood. Um, but council member, to your point, we are always appreciative when an elected official will open their office and we're very happy to work with you um, if you choose to open your office on those days to make sure that that message gets out to the community. Thank you. Do you can you send me a list of those agencies that open the doors and do you know why they're not utilized? So this was, and I, I want to be clear that this was just in relation to this past, uh, this extreme heat, the, the July extreme heat, which was one of the worst we've seen on record. Um, we had, um, I think DCAS opened their lobby. I think um, o OEM, NYSEM, opened our lobbies. Um, yeah, you have to, city. if you could just send me the, if you don't mind, if yes, you could send me absolutely. the list. absolutely, yes. And, uh, and also, um, oh, how many uh, MTA buses working with the MTA? How many MTA buses served as a cooling center over the, those four days? Um, we didn't do them, we didn't use MTA buses for cooling, for standalone cooling centers. We do use MTA buses when there's been some kind of vacate or fire and people are, are outside of their homes and, they're that, and there's not a cooling center immediately nearby. We will use a bus while those people are out of their homes. Okay. But they're not, they're not usually used as cooling centers day in and day out. And why is that? MTA, MTA is very, very, they're one of our best partners. Um, they're very happy to respond during an emergency, but most of their fleet is taken up during the days by okay. their routes. Great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up you know, on your testimony, um, Commissioner, is that can we get a copy of the emergency plan? Absolutely. That you provide to all the, um, the service providers? We, we absolutely, we can do that. Um, the, just want you to know that right now it's in a, I have it right here if you want, give you a copy of it. It's in draft form uh, because of the experience of July and August, we're making some revisions. And we're also uh, asking our partner at NISM to take a look at it to make sure that uh, it is aligned with some of the emergency procedures. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, Director Conroy, with OEM, I know that we have a lot of the CERT team, um, and what I've heard from constituents in my district is that OEM is like combining uh, a lot of the CERT team together, and there were some, uh, what I hear from constituents is that they really feel that, you know, they are located in specific neighborhood, and just by lumping them all together, to them it doesn't really uh, make sense or, or really help for them to really be able to work in their own neighborhood that they are very, very familiar with. I can't, I can't speak to the, the movement of the teams around from dif different, 
district to different district, but I can say that when there's a big emergency or citywide emergency, we will actually ask CERT teams from other neighborhoods to respond to those to the emergency, and that's completely voluntary if they choose to respond. Um, but I can get more information about whether or not there's been any restructuring of the districts for uh, CERT teams. Yeah, I mean, in my district, uh, you know, the Tribeca serve, and now it's like all together with the CERT in the Lower East Side, and they all sort of like combined together, mm. and they felt like, well, there are local issues and, and local uh, emergencies, and then it's like... I hear that. I'll get more information on that for you. Okay, that's good. Uh, the other thing is that on the testimony, I also talked about 770,000 people uh, registered with the, um, the AWS, the Advanced Warning System. Um, are we working on getting more people sign up? Like, is every senior that goes to a center commissioner, are they all signed up? I cannot answer that. Uh, but we will look at, at seeing that the way we do some other benefits and entitlements, we can look at that. And also, are they, I, I'm, I'm not even familiar, are they in multiple languages or people can sign up for different languages? I just, yes, yes, then? council member. Um, and uh, for advanced warning system, the idea of advanced warning system, unlike Notify NYC, which goes directly to a subscriber, advanced warning system is designed to go to a service provider that provides services to um, the elderly or people with access and functional needs so that the provider can tailor that message and get that message to the recipient in a way that makes the most sense to them because they understand their, their constituents. Um, so not every senior would be getting AWS, but we hope that every senior would be getting the message through the senior center providers, through Meals on Wheels, through a home care attendant, through their doctor's office, um, through any of their providers. So the 770,000 are providers and not individuals? That's correct. No. no, sorry, that's, sorry. The number you're quoting is Notify NYC. So oh, that's Notify NYC. Individuals. Okay. I'm that's sorry. individuals. Yes. So that is individuals. Okay. So, yeah, so definitely if we can work on getting more people um, to sign up, I think that, that would be great. And the thing is, like, when do you um, issue the protocol? Like, what's the protocol? Like, okay, emergency is going to be happening for you to trigger um, the emergency plan. Emergency. You're talking to yeah. me? Yeah. Okay. Like, you heard that the heat wave is coming. And well, we, I was going to say something glib, but I won't. Um, we, we work in partnership with the New York City Emergency Management Team, and uh, it's between when their offices declares it a, an emergency of whatever the nature of the emergency is, is when we activate. But in the interim, the agencies, uh, contract agencies, as well as our agencies, keep sending advisories and tips and guidance on what to do during this whatever inclement weather it is. But the actual emergency is declared by, uh, by the city, and then we follow suit. So what kind of information uh, does DIFTA give out uh, to the seniors about you know, what, what to do, how to take care during an emergency situation. Like during a heat wave, what, what are the, the services that they can take advantage of? What should they do, drink more water, keep cool? It's, like, all, it's, all, it's all of the tips on, on, on wellness during an emergency, wear light clothes, uh, stay hydrated, uh, stay in, um, in a cool area. We also give information uh, with the Department of Health, information on what are some of the symptoms of, of, of extreme heat exposure and some of the steps that you're supposed to take beyond that. So those are the kind of, that's the kind of information that we will provide. Depending on the emergency, we usually issue some guidance. If it's cold, the same thing, frostbite, all of those kind of, that kind of information. Uh, so it's tips on wellness and, and then some, some tips on what are the symptoms and indications so that then we can make provisions. Uh, so do, commissioners, so do they get it 
like in a, a brochure or a flyer, or there's a packet of information that the senior can post it on their refrigerator to remind them. Like, how do they get this information? We do the center, do the center distribute it in the different languages? Thank you for the prompt that I was just given a nod that we do have these uh, brochures and uh, emergency preparedness tips that we give out on a regular basis, not um, through, our, through our contractors, but we also have it whenever we table an event. And then you send to our office too. And we all the elected office, officials' so thank office. You. We You're get, all better informed than I am. <laughs> we get some of them. Um, Okay, so winter is around the corner. As the <laughs> councilman said. <laughs> so what is OEM and DIFTA sort of planning and preparing for this winter? I just hope it's not gonna be crazy cold, <laughs> but who knows? Right. Well, we have, we have our provisions in our plan. What we've done recently since the July uh, thing is we've tested some of our, we're testing our systems to make sure that our uh, communication systems are in place, that our reporting systems are adequate. So we're doing that kind of review of our plan and um, we will be prepared for this winter. Okay. Hopefully it's okay. something that we can prepare for. Oh, we were joined by uh, Councilmember Eugene. He has to chair the Human Rights Committee, so he's got to go back to chair his committee. But thank you for stopping by. Um, thank you for that age discrimination, <laughs> new efforts. Thank you. Yes, we're looking forward to the joint hearing. Yes. So what about preparing for next summer? I know that you are <laughs> updating. I am so, I am so prepared for next plan. summer. <laughs> I am so prepared for next summer because next summer could hopefully not be as bad as this summer. Um, there were lots of lessons learned this summer. Uh, great lessons, improvements, and we are well prepared. Um, and again, with the money and our vigilance on air conditioning, uh, keeping air conditioners in functioning uh, order is a high priority for us given you know, the experiences that we've had in the past two years. And again, I thank you for your advocacy and getting, us the, getting that additional money for those repairs. So that is, an, that is a work that never will end. It is, it is a work in, you know, that will continue. It doesn't stop in July or so September. So, Commissioner, besides the the, uh, the 249 center, we also have a lot of NORC programs, and then we have other um, centers that are funded by uh, council discretionary funding. So, are you also providing, you know, those senior programs with the support that you're giving um, to the DIFTA funded senior centers? Absolutely. Any, anybody who's in our system, NORCs are in our system, discretionary grant programs are in our system. They are not treated like redheaded children. They are given the information. However, they are not cooling centers uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, it's usually because of capacity and it's also probably because of there's just staffing needs, their, their own resources. So, uh, but they will and do have all of the information that we, um, we will provide, and we will be much better at ensuring that they get part, that they each have an emergency preparedness plan, which is not the current case. Okay, but also, I think you may want to think about reaching out to some of them because they might have the space. I mean, there are some NORC program that are in- Some Niger. of them are in facilities, buildings that could. Right. Yeah, and then the, the one that are the discretionary funding center I mean, I visited some of them. They have big space, so they're already going to be taking care of um, the seniors that goes there, but they also could serve as a, a cooling center for the community uh, close by. So we should reach out because it's still a volunteer <laughs> service, but hopefully in the R next RFP that yeah. you could put no, that, that in makes, there. That makes absolute sense to look at them as in response to mm -hmm. 
to uh, what some of the, uh, the, where those deserts may be. Yes. Uh, Council Member Rose, you have a follow-up question? I just have uh, one question. What is the criteria to be a cooling center? <laughs> uh, wait, I was just, it's the ability to house individuals with a facility that has adequate air conditioning. So, and, and um, I mean, are, are the there public. certain uh, uh, other amenities? Do they have to have a certain capacity? Do they have to have chairs? Do they have to have, yeah. you know, oh, I could public only answer restrooms? Um, OCM what are is the, better equipped thank to you. answer that. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, our main criteria is that they will open to the public, not just to their constituents, not just to their clients during a heat emergency, when we declare a heat emergency. Um, and that they are, have adequate air conditioning, public restrooms, water available, and staff on avail um, available as well. And ideally, that they have something else on offer as well. But those are the baseline criteria. Um, so do they have to like have enough ch chairs? Uh, I mean, we would, I we mean, would, yes, we would like it to be a, a comfortable, welcoming place that someone could come in and relax mm -hmm. and um, not just an empty room. Um, but, you know, our main thing is that they will open their doors to anyone and that they will provide a cool, safe space for someone. And do they um, have to provide um, some kind of meal or snack or...? Um, they do not. That's not one okay. of the criteria. It's an added benefit, definitely. Um, but water is, water is something we do ask them to have provided either from a water fountain... So just fountain sort of a, a passive space where um, at least they can have a chair. To yes. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, I just have a, a final couple of questions. Uh, Commissioner, will you share the data uh, on the cooling center attendance with us? Oh, sure. Once you... Uh, I have that. Oh, you have it. I have it. Uh, and I could probably provide it to you as a sheet that you can enter into the... So on Friday, I can tell you on the, during the heat emergencies, okay? On Friday, uh, July 19th, during regular working hours, we had 21,209 people in attendance. During extended hours, we had 3,093 people for a total of 24,302 people in attendance at the cooling centers, at the DIFTA cooling centers. For Saturday the 20th, we had um, 4,688 in attendance. For Sunday, um, the 21st, we had 4,064 in attendance. Again, for the August heat wave, on August 16th, during regular uh, business hours, we had 22,293 in attendance. And then for the extended hours that Friday, there was 1,801 for a total of 24,094. I can give you this so you, you Yeah, if you think. can give us a chart, and it would be great to, right. if you could break it down in terms of the, the senior center that, that are cooling This is center. only senior center information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you have the total, but yeah, I think it would be great. The total is 100,963. Yeah, but I, I think we wanted to also see, in terms of the, the senior centers themselves, what is each one that is a cooling center, their attendance, right? You, you have- Oh, broken down by the 138 or something like that. Is that what you want? Okay. We can, we, we can get that to you. That's yeah, going to that, take a little, that'll take a little longer. Yeah, right. that's fine. But it'd be, okay. it'd be great for us to see in terms of where the, you know, most attendance and then maybe we can work with you on doing more outreach in the council's district. If, if those centers are sure, located in sure. council members district, we can help. Right. Um, but I can yeah. give you, but I can give you now what the total aggregate. And total. can you also uh, give us a mid-year report on expense uh, being pulled from the, the $4 million? Sure. And lastly, Commissioner, uh, we're still waiting on the, uh, the food budget analysis um you haven't received the food budget analysis no so uh i know you've been working very hard to get the money out the door 
Uh, I know we have conversations, but if you can share the, the detail with us. Of course we will. I'm, I, I totally, uh, I'm sorry about that. I thought you had it. I thought it was also when you also met with OMB, but I will make sure you get that analysis. Absolutely. Great. And uh, you want the overall analysis. That's what we're looking for, right? That's what was the formula and what was the premise that we did it on? Absolutely. I'm sorry that you do not have that. No, because we want to make sure that we're going to advocate for more, right? Next year. Moment. Because we need more senior centers, right, I, Commissioner? So we got to make sure they are well funded. So that's why we, we're, we're very happy that you're the commissioner and we are very happy that we'll be working closely together to make this happen. We will continue to do so. Yeah, so thank you for being here and thank, thank you, you. Uh, director, um, and thank you to all your staff. Um, so we are gonna call the, the public panel. Okay, uh, polling aims. CPC yeah. Project Open Door Center, Molly Krakowski, JASA, and Kathleen Andrews from uh, Live On New York. Anybody else? And you JT Falcone from United Neighborhood Houses. Do you want to come here? So, Commissioner, okay. you're done. <laughs> I'm done. All yes. right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I mean, you're welcome to stay and hear what the advocates are saying. No, I, I, you are, you. But I know you have a lot of work to do. started this together. Oh, Commissioner, we, you, we, you got to help get the, uh, the senior center in my district, Independence Plaza I North. Think you were gonna ask yes, I got some updates, but I need to have that center reopen ASAP. speak first. So I've been designated to start. Um, my name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. As many of you know, Live On New York is a, an umbrella organization that represents more than 100 community-based organizations that provide services throughout the five boroughs, including senior centers, home-delivered meals, and the gamut of services that an older adult might need to thrive in their later years. As uh, the commissioner mentioned and we discussed thoroughly, in the event of a heat wave or extreme winter weather, the city has designated a number of havens to which an older adult can escape. Some of these are located in NYCHA community centers or senior centers throughout the five boroughs. Many of Live on New York's members operate these sites, providing heat or air conditioning to some of New York's most vulnerable populations. As noted, the community organizations are often asked to operate outside of their normal business hours, such as on weekends, their time off, in order to ensure that older New Yorkers without access to cool spaces are kept safe. These organizations work hard daily to serve their respective communities, and during bouts of extreme weather, their dedication does not waver. Live on New York would respectfully like to submit several recommendations to continue improving the way in which we protect older New Yorkers in the event of extreme weather. First and foremost, we wanna thank the administration and city council for baselining funds in the FY20 budget to continue to make repairs as we know they will be crucial moving forward. We are especially happy that this, these funds are baselined so we will see them moving forward and um, it's not one-time funding which is always a challenge. Um, unfortunately, however, Live on New York is unsure if the amount of funds that were allocated are sufficient to meeting the demand, or if this demand will keep pace in the coming years, and to what extent capital needs come into play. To this end, we recommend that the Department for the Aging publicly report on projected infrastructure-related expenses and capital needs over the next 10 years. While this is some ways reflected in DIPTA's capital plan, more could be done to survey, outline, articulate and prepare for expected needs. For example, many, and this is outside of my written testimony, many senior centers could probably tell you that HVAC is just barely hanging on and it's very likely that there's going to be a crisis soon. I think that there could be some work to be done to say, in five years we're going to need to completely replace this one 
it's, it's at the end of its expected useful life. So to the extent that we can do that, we'll be able to create a list that is more consistent throughout the summer where centers aren't falling offline midway through the year. Additionally, as was noted by the commissioner, climate change will only continue to produce these bouts of extreme weather. So we can encourage continued efforts by DIFTA and the mayor's office of emergency management and other agencies to coordinate communications and support warming and cooling centers as well as the older adults they seek to serve. Finally, the agencies must consider and clearly indicate in advance of emergency situations what additional supports are reimbursable for organizations acting as cooling centers, especially when acting outside of the normal course of business hours. For example, organizations must be clearly aware of if the following are reimbursable at the outset of the cooling season so they can prepare their staff to understand that they might be asked to step up and be a resource to their community on a weekend or a, an extended hour. So the senior center would need to know, are we able to purchase additional food? Can we serve lunch? Will that be reimbursed or will that have to come out of our own bottom line? As well as additional staff overtime, is that certainly volunteer or is that um, something that will be able to be added as overtime? I know that the Department for the Aging did make efforts to have these discussions, but I think a clear understanding at the outset would be helpful. <clears throat> so in closing, we emphasize our appreciation to both the administration and city council for your interest in this issue, and we look forward to working with you all moving forward. Hi, my name is Molly Krakowski. I am the Senior Director of Government Affairs at JASA. Um, thank you, uh, Council Member Chin and the committee for holding today's important hearing on hearing, um, <laughs> on protecting seniors from extreme heat and cold. Uh, JASA is a nonprofit agency. We serve older adults throughout the greater New York area uh, with a mission to sustain and enrich the lives of older New York's uh, um, aging population and um, so that they can remain in the community with dignity and autonomy. Um, as we finish the summer an inch closer to the winter season, JASA holds contracts for 22 senior centers. We have five case management programs, 14 NORC programs throughout New York City, which puts us in a unique position to serve many of the neighborhoods and communities. And over the years, the administration has turned to senior centers to provide the respite from the high summer heat. It's a laudable action. Too many older adults are vulnerable in heat waves. In preparation for these challenging weather conditions, there are often announcements that are shared by the New York City Department for the Aging through the media stating that there'll be senior centers open and people are encouraged to go to these sites rather than suffer the weather at home. And while many of JASA sites are open for extended hours on these special days, not all sites have the ability to provide this kind of emergency relief. For example, a number of JASA senior centers are located in New York City Housing Authority facilities. Currently, two of JASA's NYCHA-based senior centers have HVAC problems that are being evaluated and hopefully replaced. On extremely hot days, JASA has used stationary air conditioning units and offered programs in smaller rooms when available in order to provide a safe environment to participants. JASA also has senior centers um, that are co-located. One is co-located in a synagogue, which has inadequate air conditioning and cannot serve as a cooling center. There's no funding to fix an inadequate air conditioning system in a place like a synagogue. Um, JASA doesn't have control of the facilities. And for regular programming, JASA has similarly used an alternate room with temporary air conditioning or fans. Some centers, and this is not in my testimony, but um, some centers are also con have contracts that require us to vacate a location as soon as the programs end. They may be co-located in a community center where the afternoon programming is for youth. Um, we can have no late nights, no weekends. Um, there are other housing entities that participate in a, a New York City program to reduce energy, um, an energy safe program, and as a result, they're um, asked to eliminate the usage of electricity on certain days, and so this also ends up conflicting with the ability to provide a respite. Um, in terms of communication, when DIFTA issues a warning and suggests that older adults attend a cooling center, many older adults assume that all senior centers are open 
it would make sense to have DIFTA confirm the status of the cooling at participating senior centers to ensure that the list centers are ab still able to provide relief from the heat. An annual survey is inadequate to verify real-time situations, and although I heard the commissioner say that they're regularly checking that, I'm not sure um, that that's in fact the case with all centers. Um, Often this decision to activate a cooling center is made by DIFTA with a very short notice to programs. Uh, early DIFTA communication would be appreciated to enable coordination um, and on after hour staffs and, and sites. An improved alert system to agency administrators will ensure that programs are adequately staffed during extended hours. And I'll just say on that that I know a number of the senior centers were directly contacted by DIFTA as opposed to the agency being contacted to speak with the centers. And so it creates um, a, a line of communication that can be complicated, um, where a senior center is feeling very pressured because of the, where the call is coming from, and it's not coming through the agency, and that creates some tension. Um, finally, utilization issues. Um, it was Jazz's experience this summer that more individuals use the cooling centers on the weekends than after hours um, on the weekdays. And we believe that this may be related to an interest in socializing with peers uh, rather than heat alleviation. And this was something that was anecdotal and we're gonna be doing our own surveys. We suggest that DIFTA prepare, distribute, and analyze the findings of a survey that they may create that would help clarify the needs and preferences and inform on expanded pl uh, program planning. Another issue worth exploring is whether clients of case management programs would use cooling centers if transportation or an escort were available. Um, she said that many did not use transportation, but I'm not sure um, how it's been described to clients or to programs and agencies in terms of use of transportation dollars to transport the clients. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Let me just ask you a question quickly. So. You have a copy of um, DIFTA's uh, emergency plan? Or all the protocols and what to do during the I wait? don't, but I imagine someone does, and I'm gonna find out when I get back to the office. Yeah, I mean. I haven't personally seen it, but I imagine that we have. Well, I assume a, that the, uh, the provider should have it also, because you run the, the centers. Yes, and I, and I know that the programs have plans in place. I just don't know who has a copy of and, and who, how it gets reviewed. So and I need to find out. as you said, earlier <laughs> notice. I mean, they could definitely don't have to wait until the heat wave is coming and then you know, start yeah. issuing. We all, um, we all know and we all listen to the news and we hear for a week about this horrifying weather that's coming. So when it comes on a Friday morning for a Friday night, opening late, it sometimes um, complicates things. Yeah, but that's definitely they could start early. Yeah. Like in the, the and I would be interested in the list, um, if it's publicly available, of how many people are attending different senior centers because the centers that we have with the most participants on those cooling days are sites where they're co-located in a building where most of the people live and where there's air conditioning. So I'm, that's why I'm saying anecdotally, We've heard that it's more about supporting us, being there to socialize. It's a weekend program, um, which is all wonderful, um, but not necessarily in some of those cases because people don't have the air conditioning. Maybe it's saving them money. Maybe, you know, there may be other reasons, um, but it's worth exploring um, rather than assuming why people are coming to the centers. Well, we'll look at the yeah. statistic that DIFTA provides, <coughs> yeah. uh, and then we'll share it with the advocates. With you. Thanks. Thanks. Good morning, our lovely and honorable uh, committee chair, uh, Mark Lee Chen, and all the city council members. My name is uh, Paul Leng Eng. I'm very happy, you know, I come over here to sharing with you uh, what is our needs. Open Door Senior Center is really open our door since the 1972, 47 years already. I am only one director over here, over there until right now. So I really did understand what's the need for the, our seniors. But the point is I, I would like to use this opportunity to thank you department for the agent 
and all the public elect officers support our open door. We fight for 12 years since the, uh, the 1993 to the 2005. Then we could move to our lovely facility, 168 Grand is landmark building, former police headquarters. But the one thing, we feel very power of our community. We feel power, we get a very lovely facility. But the department for the agent talked to me before we move in. And he said that pulling in, I only guarantee you provide the professional and the engineer and uh, to maintenance your building with the DDC only five years. But right now it's 14 years, five years gone. But you know, since the 1910, we don't have, you know, anyone take good care of our huge facility. We, so that's why, you know, we are suffering. The Department for the Asian don't give us the money. When we're facing any problem, I call them, they always said that no money. They said that only five years. I promise only five years. But the one thing, you know, if you want to keep the facility good, me is not the professional engineer. I really want to be the super lady and take good care of everything. But the point is, but I don't like this beautiful facility, be it uh, winter time, provide a lot of air conditioning. During the, you know, and um, summertime give us a lot of heat. But I just wonder the Department for the Asian Field Power of us and said that Poland, you had the very best senior center in the city. Why? You over utilization. But the one thing, no money, how could I run the program well? We are always over utilization. But the night now, I just want to thank you, our lovely Margaret Chen. She listened to us, you know, and give us some money. So, not, in, not enough. Only about some money. We need half million dollars to fix the heater, the air conditioning, and also our door broken. Our window is broken. A lot of things broken. So that's why I try very hard to get the peace. Doesn't matter you give me money or not. I really find I'll get the peace first and let you know how much money I need. So the senior complaint, they said that Poland, we had a very lovely facility. Unfortunately, you po the one thing you provide a lot of different activity. The ping pong people, the player, they said that so hard. How could we play ping pong? Someone said that I want to dance. Oh, so hard. How could we dance? They always complain. I really understand that. You know, so that's why I thank you, the city council, Margaret Chen, or the city council person. Please, I know you are rich. We are poor. <laughs> okay, I know you are very rich. You are powerful. You, all of you are powerful person. Oh, Pauline, we, I am small potato. Pauline, but the we one thing, taxpayers dollar. Oh, but I want to make sure. I don't know if anybody from Difta is still here. Okay, I really would like you to set up an appointment uh, yeah. and to visit Open Door because yeah. we fought for the money to pay for repairs and DIFTA, the commissioner said, you know, you, there is a procedure, you can apply. So I want to make sure that you work with DIFTA and apply and get the HVAC system yeah. and at least start evaluating 
the repair that's needed so that you continue to provide a really nice facility for the senior because we forth for the money every year uh, yeah. but we got to make sure uh, the provider the center apply to DIFTA to get the repair done but so uh, before you leave polling, make sure you reach yeah, out. Yeah, but also, and um, our lovely committee chair. Sorry, I should talk to. I should talk more. But the one thing, we not only care of our clients and our staff and all the little person, but the one thing you understand how hard for the director's job. We still with deal with the fire department. We still deal with the building department. We still deal with the health department. When they come over here to visit our center, they test our hot water. Hot water is not hot because the system broken. Is the director's job? Yes. But so that's why I said that. Please help me talk to the, our love city council person. Give us our money to fix everything. So I let everyone happy because the open door really open our heart. Not o only open our door, open our heart to concern all the little person, little senior. I don't want to abuse our senior and also abuse, abuse our member, uh, our staff. You know, something like cooling center, they said that polling, you had a very lovely facility. Do you belong to the cooling center? I said, yes, I'm so happy we belong to the cooling center. But when the people come in, they said that really hard. What do you mean there's a cooling center? Cooling center should be cool, no hot. We don't need the heat, we need the air conditioning. Okay, How could I respond to that? Yeah, this is uh, one thing you know that. The also cooling center should open to the public, not only for our little person. When the people come in, they say that could I stay? I cannot re deny that. So that's why, you know, the one thing that keep on, give me money, I could resolve all the problem. Okay? Okay, the but money right now, is with DIFTA. But right now, how could I resolve the temporary problem? I just, uh, you know, fund, use my fundraising money to buy some friends and some heater. So that's not enough. I really want you give me almost half million dollars to fix everything. I give you the piece if you want. Okay. Okay. You're okay. Gonna thank you. You're going to have to set up a meeting. Okay, Pauline. Thank you. Uh, oh. Please set up the meeting with DIFTA, really, because we and fought also hard. the lovely city council too. Yeah, council we fought members hard too. for the maintenance money, and we fought hard for the air conditioning money. Yeah. So, DIFTA, will have to meet with you and work that out. Okay. Thank and you, also, Pauline. you could chat our data from the department for the agent. We, we are will. so great. We over utilization every day, including we belong to the cooling center, no air conditioning, we still over utilization. Okay. Thank I don't you. want to abuse them. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Chair Chin and uh, the Committee for the Aging um, for the opportunity to testify uh, and for your interest in this issue. Uh, I'm here representing United Neighborhood Houses, UNH. Uh, we are a policy and social change organization representing 42 settlement houses across New York State. We run 41 DIFTA-funded senior centers uh, in New York City, our members do. And after the recent heat wave, we surveyed them to see uh, what were the um, challenges, what worked well, what happened with the emergency rollout of extended senior center hours over the weekend uh, and, and at night on the weekdays. So we learned that ultimately the centers were well utilized, uh, both by regular senior center members and new visitors from neighborhoods and beyond. Um, 
programs appreciated the additional resources like Gatorade, Metro Cards, and offers to cover staff and refreshments. I do think that uh, our members would agree with some of the uh, anecdotal evidence that the centers were primarily being used as a social gathering space and that, uh, especially on the weekends, that generated a lot of the um, attendance. Our senior centers that were able to offer some sort of programs who maybe had a little bit of extra general operating that they could put towards doing uh, some additional activities, I think it vibes with some of the questioning that happened earlier that offering activities, offering other things that might incentivize attendance can also help to turn out the neighborhood um, during the heat waves. There were a few challenges that our members reported, uh, the biggest one being that given all of the various agencies involved, we're talking about DIFTA, uh, DYCD working with Cornerstones, uh, NYC Emergency Management, New York City Housing Authority, um, DOHMH, there's all sorts of different agencies that are part of the mix, and one big challenge that we got was that the information coming from different agencies wasn't always consistent. So uh, there might be something that comes from DIFTA, and I, and I heard the commissioner talking about uh, the number of person hours that they invested outreaching their contractors, and I think that part of the confusion that we were hearing from our members was that the information that they were getting during different rounds of outreach didn't necessarily match what they were hearing. Uh, and so our primary recommendation here, I'll just jump right into it, is that it would be really important for um, there to be a clearly identified staff member at NYCEM who has the authority to sort of speak on these issues, right? So it's really important, excited to hear about um, DIFTA's uh, updating their emergency action plan. Um, but in addition to that plan, at the end of the day, when the, the mercury starts rising and, and we're seeing the heat coming on the news in, in you know, five, six, ten days out with the weather forecasting technologies we've got now in 2019, uh, it's great to have someone who the buck stops with them. Uh, it makes sense for NYCEM at the center of that, to be at the center of that. Um, this would be a person that could coordinate messaging, flow of information, uh, and they have to be, like I'm saying, empowered with final say because when there's not someone who's the, the final say on things, the information can get very confusing very fast. Another concern that we heard from our members, especially those who are uh, in NYCHA, is that NYCHA and DIFTA are keeping, and DYCD as well, are keeping separate lists. So if a member uh, reaches out to NYCHA to say, hey, my air conditioner doesn't work, we need to be taken off the cooling center list, they might be removed from NYCHA's list, but they might not be removed from DIFTA's. So making sure that there is a centralized list um, for anything that, that happens, um, because as we know with the aging infrastructure, especially in the NYCHA buildings, but, but overall, the, the aging infrastructure makes it very possible that especially when we're cranking up to, to max capacity here on the really hot days, um, the systems might go down, and, and like you're saying, a, an annual review isn't necessarily going to capture some of the last minute uh, interruptions to the air conditioning that might come in or heating during the winter. Um, like my, my co-panelists have said here, during the spring and fall, uh, that person who would be the, the final say at NYCEM would be working to ensure that heating and cooling centers are prepared uh, for when the weather emergencies happen later. Uh, and making sure that there is especially, like, like Caitlin had mentioned, uh, knowing exactly what kind of in expenses are going to be reimbursable. Um, so that the plans can be made, the preparation, etc. cetera. Um, also just want to thank the, the council for your advocacy on the HVAC money. Um, that was really critical. We've heard like Levon has that uh, DIFTA um, has been able to use this. Excited to hear the commissioner speaking in her testimony about um, the fact that all but six were ultimately addressed, um, and that's way down from the hearing, was it last year, uh, where it was in the 30s that, that there were HVAC issues. That said, we need to make sure that that money keeps coming out. Uh, like I'm saying, all of these HVAC systems are uh, old, 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 uh, and things pop up. Uh, like Caitlin said, many are hanging on by a thread, so making sure that that money is available uh, for continued expenses, because those are going to keep popping up. Um, Let's get some to polling. Uh, and finally, I just, I would be remiss not to take this opportunity to address generally the needs in NYCHA community centers across the city. Um, cooling, I know we're here to talk about cooling, but generally there's $500 million uh, in capital repair needs 
uh, across the community centers in NYCHA and the city. Many of those community centers are hosting seniors either for DIFTA funded senior uh, programs or just generally in community centers where activities are taking place. Uh, and it's really important for us to be looking at um, ceilings that are caving in, sewage that's backing up and interrupting the programs. If we were able to sort of keep that one money stream coming with the, with the four million to address the air conditioners, but also look at some of the recurring maintenance costs that pop up for nonprofit providers in these spaces, uh, and, and maybe some capital that could be uh, infused into that that could address issues outside of HVAC, that would be really important as well because um, these, these centers are, are providing really critical uh, programs as you know, and during emergencies, we're trying to tap them and make sure that, that folks have access to cool or, or warm, depending on the season, and so it's really important that they're at tip-top condition. Thank you very much. And uh, Tara says uh, hi from Denver. Thank you. Uh, can you make sure you give us a copy of your testimony? Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll okay. be following up uh, with an electronic copy. Okay. Um, one of the questions I have that in terms of the NYCHA uh, centers, because one of the problems that I see, even personally in my district, is we allocate uh, capital dollars you know, to fix or to repair. And like the budget is so high. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. Like, to fix up a room uh, or a kitchen is like half a million dollars. So I think that we really have to look at how do we address the real capital costs, and if there's somehow we can get other city agency to come in um, or work with the sponsored nonprofits so that we don't just have our hands tied. It is only NYCHA can do it, and they do it at such great cost. It doesn't make sense at all, uh, and it doesn't get done on a timely manner. But the, the main issue is that it just costs a lot of money to get anything done. A hundred percent, and we've heard that um, We've heard that concern raised from council members a number of times. We've been actually working in coordination with Live On and Daycare Council as the Community Space Coalition, addressing um, some of the different challenges in these NYCHA centers. One of the big things that we've been working with NYCHA directly on is creating an authorization process for the nonprofits or for their peer city agencies to run those repairs. Um, so we actually have a flowchart right now that would be NYCHA's internal deliberation to approve and then monitor the progress of a repair. So if, say, you wanted to address a concern in one of your uh, local community centers, you could uh, allocate that funding directly to the nonprofit that occupies it if they're up to the task or work with their contracting agency to perhaps be the overseer of that the rollout, there's been all kinds of different arrangements that have been discussed as to what the agencies could be and actually would be really interested in picking your brains on, on what would be most effective from, from where you sit. Uh, but definitely something that we hear and something that NYCHA is actually really interested in working with us on. So we should, we should follow up and have a conversation about it. Yeah, we would appreciate that because we do want to help uh, with the capital repair, especially in the NYCHA centers. But it's got to be, you know, we got to make sure that it gets done and at a reasonable cost. And yeah. but right now, the, the cost is really, you know, too high. We wanted to help a center replace the stove. We started with a couple of thousands, and now, you know, no, you got to fix the whole kitchen. It's like, well, and that's <laughs> assuming that the the kitchen itself was permitted, which for many kitchens it was not. So now you get a contractor in who says, actually, I can't legally attach mm -hmm. this gas line. So another conversation we can have when you're ready. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all for being here today, and thank you for your testimony, and we look forward to working with you um, and with DIFTA. Of course, you know, we start the next budget, <laughs> and, you know, so the advocacy starts. And thank you to everyone for being here today. Uh, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.